from Byron, Mississippi, it's Lakeshore Church. And now we join Pastor Jay Frazier for today's message. <laughs> Trait stimulate. Um, Luke chapter 8. We're going to begin the reading verse number 40 and 42 and then 49 to 56. Verse number 40. Remember I told you there's a, the reason the break is there's another encounter he has with the woman with the issue of blood. Verse 40, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Just then a man named Jairus came. He was a leader of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house. Because he had an only daughter about 12 years old, and she was dying. While he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. Now look at verse number 49. While he was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue's leader's house and said, Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, Don't be afraid. Only believe, and she will be saved. After he came to the house, he let no one enter with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Everyone was crying and mourning for her, but he said, Stop crying, because she is not dead but asleep. They laughed at him because they knew she was dead. So he took her by the hand and called out, Crowd, child, get up. Her spirit returned, and she got up at once. Then he gave orders that she be given something to eat. Her parents were astounded, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord. I simply ask for my words to be yours and my thoughts to be yours. And every one of us here, all the dads, for that matter, Lord, all of us, would emulate these traits that we see in Jairus' life. And God would be careful to give you the praise and the glory for what you do. For we ask it and pray it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Hmm. Let, me, let me get something uh, uh, j- just out of way as we begin. I've been saying this for a while, and I think I need to keep on saying it, uh, just because of the day and age that we live in. Uh, did you know that 40% of children being born today do not have a dad at the house? Uh, that's across economic lines. That's across racial lines. That's across all kind of, any kind of... Uh, scenario, demographic you want to come up with, four out of ten. And you know, four out of ten doesn't sound that bad because it's just a small number, but try this on for size. What if I told you that 400,000 out of a million homes don't, or children being born don't have a daddy in the home? 400,000 out of a million. When I was thinking about that for today, I was reminded that the, the, the ministry that we have, that we send out our, our worship service to a, a television station here in the Jackson area, it actually goes statewide. Um, pretty much the entire state, um, just south of Memphis and so- South Haven, all the way uh, down to the coast, basically, uh, go out. Somebody told me, we were doing a little research, found it demographically that it touches 660-something thousand homes, potentially. This morning, somebody could have turned their TV in, over 600,000 homes. And I began to think, I said, you know, that's, if you think about that, then that's, almost like 70 or 80 in our nation that's 70 or 80 percent of the whole entire population of of mississippi if you look at just that you know and and i do a lot of that i think about that kind of stuff with ratios it's amazing to me think about i've said it many times if when when we line up with the right issues i believe in america i'll stand behind the banner folks and i'll be a part of the manifesto and i really believe you want to talk about an issue that we have in our country here's one and it's not just one demographic. It, it's, it's across the board in, in our country, 40%. And so today I share that, that with you to, to remind you that as dads today, we have, this is the reason a lot of people say, well, it's just so syrupy at, on Mother's Day, but yet it's so tough on Father's Day. And, and this is some of the reason, is that we have a God-given responsibility to be that leader and to be that fatherly influence in our world. Billy Graham, you know him, he, he went to be with the Lord uh, just a couple of years ago and and uh, Billy Graham said this. He said, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. Just like there are things that go on with women that are not appreciated and a lot of things that have been changed and those kind of things. It also, when dad decides he's going to be what God wants him to be, we, we need to bring respect and honor to that because it's desperately needed in the world that we live in. This past week, I, I preached a camp and there was teenagers there and one of the mornings during the morning, there was a, mostly there were teenagers there and, and, and a few preteens, but um, I had them mostly. And then there were adults that would come in at night and made it more diversified at night. And, and uh, one day I was speaking and, and leading into it. I just asked them, I said, how many of you guys are uh, involved in a divorced home? And pretty much it was the national average. It looked like half of the ones there. 
And I noticed a couple of them really connected with me, really had their head down. All of a sudden when I said that, they just connected. For the rest of the sermon and that, because I referred to a lot of things like that, things that we deal with, we really connected. There was a young lady that came up to me afterwards um, later on that day, and, and she was small talking, and she said, uh, Brother Jay, my, my dad just got put in prison. I said, man, my heart breaks, and called her by name. And, and she said, oh, but, but don't worry, it's better. And I thought, Better? And then she began to tell me some of the things she'd been through as a, as a child, as a teenager. And I thought, wow. I mean, it was just earth-shattering. And so what, what happened for me is it really brought <laughs> a lot of this week to mind. And when I think about Jairus, there's some great traits. There's some great things that we could emulate. And, and yes, it's first for dad because it's dad's day, but, but it's also for all of us. The, it, it, it preaches for every one of us. But when I think about daddy, according to Jairus and what he did, I want to give you four thoughts, Okay. And uh, they're not going to be the deepest thing you hear, but if we'll live by them, I promise you, your, your life will be better in whatever capacity. Number one, I think about this. When I think about being a daddy, according to Jairus, number one is he loves. <laughs> uh, you can simply see because of this story that he loved his daughter. And the scripture says it was his only daughter. Now, I don't know if he had sons, but it says she was his only daughter. And so he loved. How do you know that? Well, I know he did because he did something very unusual. It, it was outside of his his his, his average day he went and sought out christ and you'd have to go study that he was a leader of the synagogue so many people of that day in the religious sector didn't even embrace christ most didn't the vast majority didn't and yet he knew jesus could possibly do something he had a belief and faith that he acted upon to me i call that love all right and and when we operate in that we see that we see that he loved he stepped out of that and, and he loved his daughter secondly when I, when I think along those lines, I'm also reminded that he leads. Um, it's not to be sexist. It's not to be a male chauvinist. It's not, even as a pastor, there's a lot of times people misunderstand this when you, when you highlight, when you say, wait a second, this is the place that God put us in and we're supposed to act well in that. Uh, I say there's a lot going on in our society. Not only do we have the absence of dad in a percentage that I share with you, but we've redefined the home. People almost laugh at the word when you say the nuclear family. We've, we've redefined the family so much that, that look at it now. And all of a sudden, when you start, ask, you, you start asking the masculine gender of the family to be what God designed him to be as a parent, there's a lot of people who's already turned you off because of all the different dynamics that we've created in our culture. Now, I'll tell you, no matter what we do in our culture, it doesn't necessarily make it right. But I see Jairus, not only did he love, but he also led. Hmm. He did. He was engaged in, and, and involved. And what's noticeably uh, absent here is mama wasn't with him when he found Jesus. There's no verse that says that. But I'll tell you where I know she was. She was at the house because later on, after the resurrection of his daughter, we see that the parents went in. So we don't see her at the front end, so we see her there at the house. So we've got to assume that she was not at, at the encounter with Christ when it started, but they got back to the house. She was there. And surely she was there because the daughter was sick and subsequently had passed away. But we see leadership there. Nelson Mandela, people can, can come up with different things, and, and I love reading about what he stood for and the things that have happened. Uh, I found this, this quote, and it's phenomenal for this. He said this, he said, to be the father of a nation is a great honor. And if you know about Man- uh, Nelson Mandela with South Africa, he said, but to be the father of a family is a greater joy. And when I saw that, I thought, man, that, that'll preach right there. There's many times we, we, we deduce it down and we think it's not as much, but I want you to know, guys, listen to me, every daddy in the room and the ones listening by Facebook, God puts a great value on the position of being a daddy. So much value that he puts uh, responsibility and accountability with it. One day I will give an accountability. As today, if my life ends, it'll be almost 26 years of it. And I will give an account how I was as a parent and, and, and how I led my family. And many more years just in marriage added to that. But he leads, hmm, and that fits so well. I want you to know it's a greater joy. We think we'd like to know everybody's name and how popular. We're, no, 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 I love that quote. And then there's the verse that I don't know if I haven't mentioned in every one of my sermons when I preach on Father's Day. I, I don't think it's ever not made the, the cut. And it's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. This, this verse is often used out of context, and I've done it at baby dedications and other things, and, and we love about, you know, the, the, the instruction and training and, and don't anger them. But yet, if you look at the entirety of the verse, it says fathers. And so this is one of those major areas that I say in the Bible that remind me that I have a specific place, and all the dads here, and all the dads hearing this, have a specific place in the home that God holds us accountable by His inspired Word. 
and instruction and training is in there. And also another word that I think fits here, if you go back and study the original language, is discipline. You know, there is that. I believe everything about me that, and Suzanne, we have three children, and, and I believe she bonded with her, our children before they were ever born. I think research says that. They, they found out there's something about that carrying that child inside another body. There's no, natural bonding that goes on, and all three of mine have a natural bonding with their mother. So if that doesn't happen in the daddy's life when she's carrying them, when, do, how, when and how does bonding take place in the home when it comes to daddy? And I believe with everything about me, it happens in the, in the arena of instruction and training and discipline and the such. I believe it's in that authority. It's in that place that God gives us. And listen, I want to come back to it. I don't want to stay on that down stat this whole time, but just think about it. Think about what that's doing to erode the very fiber and, and the foundation of America is that if we have a great percentage of homes that don't have that influence at the house. And let me also compliment women that have had to come along. There you got 40% that are having to come along and be both to the home. So not only is the mama having to do everything that God has designed her to be, but she's having to take up the slack if he's not there. And then my heart breaks too, and I know of stories where men have had to take on the role of doing the mama thing because mama has not been faithful like she needs to be. And I just look at this as being a major issue in America that you very seldom hear talked about. It's amazing, isn't it? We got all this kind of stuff we like to talk about, but we've redefined the home so much that we can't even define it today in our society any longer. And yet if you can't define it, and it's, and it's, re, and it's been jumbled all around, how will we ever get to a foundation that brings glory and honor to the Lord? And this is what I said about leading. You want to have a strong country and a community? You must have a strong church in that arena. I believe everything about me. The Bible says that judgment must begin at the house of God. I believe the strength of our country is based on the strength of our faith that we have in our churches. I believe it. We've got to have strong churches. I do. Churches that will stand for what's right. Churches that will know what the Word says and stand accordingly. I believe we're going to have a strong community. You've got to have strong churches. And I know a lot of our uh, political people that I know in this community understand that. I get a lot of calls, have a lot of conversations with our uh, uh, politicians in our, com- in our community. They know it. If you want to have a strong community, you've got to have strong churches. But listen to me. If you're going to have a strong church, you've got to have strong families in the church. Huh. See, a church will never be what she needs to be if you've got a bunch of fractured and fragmented families. And see, the, the, the family unit must be as strong as it possibly can be. And I say again, my heart breaks and goes out, and, and, and hopefully we come alongside and make it better for the single parent and, and the one that's making it happen. And we, we take some off and, and make it easier as a, as a church. But understand this, God's way is the best way. And when we, we redetermine it and we have another foundation and, and all that, it will never be huh, as good as it can be the way it began. We pay a price for that. And I do know, I, there's very few times I'll tell you I know what I'm talking about. But as far as my own individual life, I know what I'm talking about because of things as they go on. So a daddy, according to Jairus, he loves and he leads. Let me give you two more. He also goes out on a limb. Mm. From time to time, as a daddy, God expects us to do things that stick out. There are times that we live on the outside, outside of our comfort zone. There are times things come along and we have to make decisions and do things as daddies that are outside of our comfort zone. Let me establish it and put it in context with Jairus. He was a leader of the synagogue. They didn't, they didn't embrace Jesus. And, and what's noticeably absent in the story is we don't know whether he had a previous relationship with Christ. We don't know if Christ had, had met his need or he had encountered Christ before. It says nothing like that. We don't know if he had just heard about what Jesus was doing and, and he made a parallel that I have a sick daughter that's at the point of death. And so I, I want to come and ask him if he'll come help me. We don't know. And I like that in a way because you, we shouldn't just put a little, a, little, not a little point there, and if it doesn't apply, then we just leave it alone. I like the idea that no matter how you heard about Christ and you've known about him all your life or he's brand new to you today, he can do something for you no one else can do. That's the great news today. And so we don't come up with these, these, these little things that we put, these little boxes we put everybody in to make sure you only fit this. I'm glad that God can be all things to all people who will allow him to be. But we have to go out on a limb. Hmm. Listen, there's sometimes as a dad, you don't do things you don't want to do. Uh, I, I told this, and I hope it doesn't get me in too much trouble because Suzanne's here. I remember like yesterday, Zane was just a little bitty thing. He's just a little bitty thing. And uh, he, he was, you know, he acted like her side of the family. So, so he'd been doing some stuff. So I come home, and this is what she said. She'd already put him in his room, and she said, you need to go back there and spank Zane. I said, I do. 
Yeah, you need to spank him. You're, you're his dad. You need to go back there and spank him. I said, man, she tells me a story, and then I'm thinking, well, I don't want mama to be mad because, you know, if mommy ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. If daddy ain't happy, nobody gives a rip. But anyway, so I said, well, I got to do what mama wants me to do. So I go back there, and I have this conversation with Zane. I'm, I'm sure I tore him up, too. There was probably no RPMs on the old hand when I put it on his gluteus maximus. Anyway, I walked back in the den after, I'm just sort of proud, you know. Suzanne should be proud. I did what she asked me to do, and Suzanne's in the den crying. I said, why are you crying? She said, because you spanked Zane. <laughs> what, what, do you understand what I'm talking about? Sometimes daddy's out on a limb. I mean, I, I'm bad if I don't, bad if I do. I'm just by myself. I've laid in the bed before and asked Suzanne, just tell me you love me. Just tell me you love me. She said, what? And now she knows what's coming when I said, just tell me you love me. I remember the first time I ever did, just tell me you love me. She said, why do you want me to tell you, <laughs> tell you I love you? I said, because nobody else in this house loves me. There's sometimes daddy's got to be out on a limb. Listen to me. I do believe God gave us enough cushion. One, one person I heard say it best is that it's something about God, the way God created us for a child. If you'll warm that glutamus maximus, it will stimulate the cerebral cortex of their brain. I do think it's tied together. If a child doesn't have discipline, a child doesn't have parameters, they'll create their own. Believe everything about me. I believe it parallels to our relationship with Christ. He that the sun sets free is free indeed. But you know what I know about my relationship with Christ? There's parameters. If I don't live in obedience to him, then my freedom is hampered. Is that a paradox? Yes, God's good at them all the time. The last shall be first. I don't understand that one. And on and on we could go. But I think it's the place God put daddy. Sometimes dads have to get out on a limb. Now listen to me. It's not about self-gain, but it's about bringing glory and honor to the Lord. See, that's where we mess up. You will do what I tell you to do because I'm your daddy. I brought you in this world. I'll take you out. I'll make another one just like you. And our mindset, it went, all of a sudden becomes self and it becomes pride. I'm talking about a relationship that I'm up underneath my heavenly father and I want to be what God wants me to be so that the generation behind me has a chance to be what God wants them to be. It's not this self-promotion stuff. No, no, no. That's called pride. We need to get, take that stuff to the altar. But I think along these lines, see, it goes, they go out on a limb. <laughs> I believe everything about me. That's what dads do. Hmm. Oh, listen. And the last, said enough of that. Daddy, according to Jairus, also knows life depends on Christ. Hmm. Today, if you listen to all the things going on, even in the church, it seems to be the issues of the day of our, is our economy. It's all kind of social ills and issues. It's our energy independence. I hear that a lot. And it's climate change, whether you believe in it or not. You hear these things over and over and over and over. I want to again say that I believe a major issue, if not the major issue today, is the person that God put in the family to lead. If we don't lead, it's an issue. Maybe even epidemic. We would never say pandemic because that sounds medical. But listen to me. What I love about the story of Jairus, and I don't know how he got to this point to make this decision, but he knew that Jesus Christ was the only hope. He had gotten to that point. It's amazing in the story that the women, woman with the issue of blood, same thing was happening. She was, that was, his, was her last choice, was her last hope. It says she spent all she had, and she was even worse. And so I've come to tell you today there was a daddy that realized my daughter, and all this is going on, my only hope is him. And say, so I want you to know today, so well, I've never faced that kind of thing, Brother Jay. You have, and you didn't know it. Listen to me very carefully. Jesus is our only hope to life. And see, sometimes we get it all mixed up. If you don't even realize that all your life is about earthly stuff, it's about having a job, it's about putting food on the table, it's about our physical health, it's about all the things we have going on. But I want to remind you that Jesus Christ, though we're blessed in all of that way, there's also a life that I have within me that, yes, my earthly life encompasses now, encompasses it because I'm the, temp I'm the temple of God, but I have within me an eternal life that I'm going to live forever. Not because of what Jay did. It's not because of what Jay does. Not being a pastor. It's not being a, a great parent. It's not even being a good person or a husband. It's, it's about knowing Jesus Christ. And just like this speaks volumes to me, just like Jairus sought out Jesus for help in his life, you and I seek him out for help in our eternal life. And then the rest of it's just gravy. The last time I checked, the mortality rate's 100%. We fret and do all things. It reminds me of Lazarus. I mean, I might do an encounter on Lazarus before the summer's out. But my favorite, probably my favorite part of the story of Lazarus, yes, the resurrection is powerful and loose him and let him go. My most, I love the thought. I have four sisters. I love the thought 
that surely Lazarus sat down with those two sisters and said, why couldn't y'all just leave it alone? Man, I was camping out in glory. I was unpacking my bags. I mean, I was enjoying paradise, and you busy body sisters of mine had to call me back from the grave. You played on Jesus' sympathy. <laughs> People say, oh, you're reading a lot into it. Well, I just got to believe when he came back to this dirty, nasty world, and he'd already experienced the world that God's prepared, I got to believe. I know I would with my four sisters. I got two older and two younger. Man, I'd say, listen, just leave it alone. I was doing just fine. You folks called me back from the grave <laughs> with Jesus' help. Just leave it alone. I think in the same way. Here's Jairus. It cost him everything, really, with his peers. Hmm? He knew the life that he was looking for was found in Jesus Christ. And that's our hope today as well. Listen to the word today. It says this, Psalm 103, 13 says, For as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on us who fear him. When I was putting this together, it spoke volumes to me because it's assumed that fathers have compassion on their children. <laughs> Isn't that a great trait to remember? It's, it's, you understand what I'm talking about? It's like assumed that fathers have compassion on their children. And so that might be a good thought for us today. Okay, God, help me with my compassion for my children. Exodus 20, 12 says, Honor your father and your mother so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Um, I, I, I thought about this. I, I thought this verse, really, the, the interpretation of it is, if you don't honor your dad, he'll just kill you. I mean, that's why you, you want a long life, you need to honor him. Uh, Proverbs 23, 22 says, listen to your father who gave you life and don't despise your mother when she is old. Hmm. Ephesians 6, 4, are you used to, but here it is again, fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Genesis 18, 19, for I have, I have chosen him so he will command his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. This is how the Lord will fulfill to Abraham what he promised him. You see the promise? You remember the promise that he made to him, the covenant that he made, that the, the sand, you won't be able to number the sand, you know, you, but the, the, the sand, the, the little kernel of grains of sand, you won't be able to number them, nor the stars in the sky. That's what your lineage is going to be. Right now, there are three major religions that encompass billions of people that call him Father Abraham. God was true to his promise that he made to Abraham, but this is where it started. It started, if you'll be faithful to me and what you need to do in the little bit, I'll make you a father of many. And one more, Malachi 4, 6 says, I love this verse, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the lamb with a curse. Um, that sounds pretty... Uh, that parallels, in my opinion, all of what I've said today, is that I believe in our, in our life, in our world that we live in today, we need, a, we need to have a return to what the heart of the dad is supposed to be. And we also need to have what the heart of the children need to be. Uh, it, it works. I'm going to close with this. One question, all right, it is this. Um, <laughs> I, I've never preached this before 8.30, I mean before 9 o'clock. I'm getting better at saying 9 instead of 8.30, by the way, and saying 10.30 instead of 11.00. What do, you, what do you think, and we don't have any information, what do you think this all did for the daughter? I was just working on this, and I thought, what? I just began in my mind to think, what did this do for the daughter? I wonder when she was brought back to life, I wonder what it did for her view of Christ. Hmm. I, I wonder, just, just thinking along those lines, I, I wonder if the week later when somebody was talking about it, the stand that she took. Sort of like blind Martimaeus. Y'all can do whatever y'all want to do with him, but all I know is I was blind and now I see. It's one of those kind of times. I wonder how she stood. I wonder about her relationship with the Lord, her view of Christ and what he did for her. And then I think this for Father's Day. I wonder what her view of her dad was. There might have been a time she wondered if her dad would stand for her. She wondered if her dad would, 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 would stick out and get out on a limb on her behalf, and yet she understood clearly that he would. I'm sure that changed. And for us, we need to be reminded of that, that that's what we're about. It's not only our relationship with him, but how we affect others. Hmm. She might have said, I'm here today because my dad went and found Christ. What a statement. You know, for us to be able to say as dads that my, my children know the Lord because I found him first. And gave that an impact to their life. Thinking with that in mind, James Dobson would be a very familiar name to a lot of people in Christian uh, circles. James Dobson, I looked this up, and if you tell me that, that time's not flying by, uh, James Dobson is 85 years of age. 
Some years ago, he passed off the major responsibilities of Focus on the Family. He was the founder of Focus on the Family. And uh, James Dobson said this about, about a daughter and, and a father. He said this, a good father will leave his imprint on his daughter for the rest of her life. A good father will leave his imprint on his daughter for the rest of her life. And today, before we go, I want to I just encourage you. Here's a great goal for every dad in the room. For that matter, all of us, but uh, surely parents. But for dad, since it's Father's Day, a great goal is this. Is when our children experience us, they experience Christ. And the first thing that comes to mind is, is there'll be a dad here that says, I'm just not that cuddly kind. You know, I, I'm just not that embracing kind. You know, I, I'm sort of the strong back, and, you know, that kind of thing. But I'll remind you, when I say experiencing Christ, remember that Christ, when he came into the temple and they were buying and selling and de- desecrating God's house, it says that he made a, a, a whip and he ran all the money changers out and he turned the tables over. That doesn't sound like the cuddly kind to me. And there are times, listen to me, there are times that you've got to be somewhat big and bad as a dad when you get out on that limb. And I'm not talking about defacing who you are in Christ. But there are some times that God needs men to have a backbone and, and stand. I really believe it. I, you know, this is not a you know, warm, fuzzy feeling, but there are those times. I've said this about uh, the, the dads in my life. Uh, I say my stepdad, I was around a lot more than my biological dad, but my dad as well. But uh, I say this, they'd warm you up. Uh, they, my, my stepdad's been gone for over two decades, but I believe God would resurrect him today if I did something wrong. I still respect him. I'm still scared of him. You talk about the fear of the Lord. I know what it's like to fear a parent. But I always said this, and I give it a tribute. There was never a time growing up in church, if I went to an altar, I, I say this, and maybe you understand it, maybe you don't. I knew it was going to happen. If I went to an altar to pray, and my, my stepdad saw it, he was going to be at the altar with me. You, might, you know how many times he ever talked to me about stuff at the altar? See, sometimes I'd like to do that, lean down and say, you ought to be praying. <laughs> you, ought to be, you ought to be asking Jesus to forgive you. You know how many times he ever talked to me about what I prayed about? Zero. But I tell people, long after you forget what somebody said to you, you will never forget what they did to you. And I just remember that. And so I'm here to tell you there's a time for us to warm them up. There's a time for us to be stable and, and, and firm and have a foundation that we stand on. But there's also time for us to be sappy too. I think you see that in, in the life of Christ. And so here's a great goal for us and we'll go. Every, every dad in the room, listen to me, listen by Facebook. When your children experience you, no matter the age, you might say, I was terrible as a dad. I, I'm way past that. Well, you know what? You can't go back, but you can go forward. You can't go back and start anew, but you can start today and make a brand new ending to this story. And here's the ending. When your children experience you, they experience Jesus Christ. Is that not a great go? We invite you to visit lakeshorecmc.org to find out more online. That's lakeshorecmc.org. Thank you for joining us.